حبيب الله رسول الله حبيب الله الله our God is the greatest the one and only glory to him he wanted humans to be the best and give his best religion to them Allah our God is the greatest the one and only glory to him he wanted humans to be the best and give his best religion to Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back to another live edition of Gardens of the Pious. As usual, we begin and we should always begin by praising the Almighty Allah. Falhamdulillahi ala kulli hal wa na'udhu billahi min hali ahl nar Then we should second that by sending the peace and salutations upon our most beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in order to seek the blessings in our work in our study, in our learning, in every aspect in our life. فَالصَّلَاةُ وَالسَّلَامِ الْأَتَمَّانِ الْأَكْمَلَانِ عَلَى نَبِيِّنَا مُحَمَّدٍ وَآلِهِ وَصَحْبِهِ وَبَعْنِ Today's episode is number 609 in the series of Riyadh al-Salihin by Imam Nawawi. May Allah have mercy on him. <coughs> and uh, it will be the second in chapter number 260. <clears throat> the chapter which deals with the prohibition of lying and telling falsehood or acting upon it. Today, insha'Allah, we'll continue with the first hadith in this chapter. Hadith number 1543. An Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al As radiallahu anhuma. An كان منافقا خالصا ومن كانت فيه خصلة منهن كانت فيه خصلة من نفاق حتى يدعها إذا تمن خان وإذا حدث كذب وإذا عاهد غدر وإذا خاصم فجر In this sound hadith Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him said Whosoever possesses these four characteristics is a sheer hypocrite, is a pure hypocrite. And anyone who possesses one of them, he possesses one of the characteristics of hypocrisy till he gives it up, till he quits it, till he ceases. So the four characteristics are whenever he talks, he tells a lie. Whenever he makes a covenant, he breaks it. And whenever he quarrels and disputes, he utters foul language. Obviously, that needs really a lot of explanation. And this is what we are doing in this program. In this sound hadith, the Prophet وسلم, warns about the traits of the hypocrites. And as you know that there are two types of hypocrisy. One which Allah the Almighty threatened such hypocrites that they will be uh, not just in hellfire, in the bottom of hellfire, even beneath all the non-believers, all those who used to associate with God, others in worship. So in Surah An-Nisa, the Almighty Allah says, إِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ فِي الدَّرْكِ الْأَسْفَلِ مِنَ النَّارِ وَلَنْ تَجِدَ لَهُمْ نَصِيرًا Then in another ayah it says, بَشِّرِ الْمُنَافِقِينَ بِأَنَّ لَهُمْ عَذَابًا أَلِيمًا In the first ayah, the Almighty Allah says, Verily, the hypocrites will be on the bottom of hellfire. As al-Jannah or heaven, different levels, and the more you ascend, the more you get closer to Allah, you get closer to the uh, company of the Messenger of Allah, to al-Firdaus al-A'la, and the prophets, uh, al-Siddiqeen, and the martyrs, and the righteous. Hellfire on the opposite, darakat. So we say daraja, if you're ascending, and we say, Darakat for descending, 
plural of daraka. That's why he said في الدرك الأسفل من النار The last level of hellfire. So all the wicked people will be on top of them and they're on the bottom. Why? Because they were the worst. Because in the case of the non-believers, they said, we don't believe in your God. Okay, their faith is known. But those people pretended by declaring the oneness of Allah in public, by saying, I believe in Muhammad and in the message of the Quran, etc. But in fact, they never did. So why did they say that? They said it in order to harm Muslims and Islam by becoming the enemy within. And they managed to do that ever since the Prophet ﷺ achieved victory on the Battle of Badr. And then the Muslim state started growing and booming and becoming powerful. So Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul was the chieftain of the hypocrites. He never, never, ever liked Prophet Muhammad nor the companions. As a matter of fact, in many private meetings, he cursed him, condemned him, he expressed how much he hates him, but he didn't have a choice. He said, if I'm going to live in this town and I'm going to maintain my superiority, then I gotta believe in this guy and see if I can harm him and his religion by becoming the enemy with him. And he did. And he caused a lot of harm. And he had many followers. And they attempted to build a mosque in order to meet in that mosque without supervision of the Prophet or the companions. Because of course, in Al-Masjid al-Nabawi, whenever you're living in Medina, you're required to go and attend. And if you're not attending, particularly Fajr and Isha, the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said, أثقلوا صلاتين على المنافقين الفجر والعشاء The heaviest prayer upon the hypocrites Fajr, morning prayer and Isha and we already know why because in Fajr uh, this morning since I was extremely tired and I was lacking sleep when the Adhan was called I was trying to convince myself I did wake up before I was trying to convince myself well because you're tired, why don't you pray home, etc. It's actually a struggle, and it's not only once. So once you remove the cover, you wipe your face as the Prophet Sallallahu used to do, yamsah wajhahu, and say, Alhamdulillah, alladhi ahyana ba'dama amatana wa alayhi nushur, you're free from the pressure of Satan. And you get up, you go to pray Fajr, it's cold, you are heavy clothed, uh, in whichever condition, sometimes it's raining, it's muddy, but you feel you love it. And once you offer the prayer in Jama'ah, you feel it made your day. And you feel some joy, delight and happiness. You don't know what is the source. I mean, you didn't earn a million dollars. Uh, you were not promoted in your job. You didn't. But you feel happy. You feel inner peace. You feel satisfaction. It's because of the Fajr prayer. The munafiq, the hypocrite, is totally the opposite. At the time of the Messenger of Allah, these guys had to show up. Like you sign in and you sign out, hey, I'm here. And Isha, likewise, it is a late prayer. Most people, after working hard during the day, they will go to sleep. And it is dark, but they had to attend in order to be seen. Allah said about them, يُرَاؤُونَ nas." They are showing off before people. And Allah has warned against the hypocrites more than the non-believers. In the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah mentioned the traits of the believers, followed uh, by the traits of the kuffar, the non-believers, followed by the traits of the hypocrites. So whenever he spoke about the believers, just a couple ayahs. Uh, then in the ladina kafaru sawa'un alayhim anzartahum am lam tunzirhum also a couple ayahs. Then the traits of the hypocrites were discussed in 13 ayahs. Wow, why? Because the ummah needed a lot of explanation, warning and clarification who is a hypocrite. And in this hadith the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said the hypocrite, irrespective of faith and belief, 
maintains four evil qualities. Obviously, he constantly lies. He's going to the masjid showing off people that he's praying, but he's not praying, he's lying. He's reading Quran in front of people or fasting in public because it's Ramadan. And when he goes home, he enjoys eating, drinking, and even drinking alcohol. And uh, whenever he is entrusted, he betrays. He's a treasurer. And whenever he promises, he breaks his promise. Ghadar. وَإِذَا خَاصَمَ fajr. al khusuma is dispute. This guy who's sitting in front of me, the cameraman, we're very close friends. MashaAllah. It's, we're talking about 15, 16 years. Do we ever differ? Do we have disputes? Of course, because we're human beings. Does he get upset sometimes? Yes. Do I get upset sometimes? Yes. But we maintain the fact that we are brothers in the deen. And one day, we were very close friends and we loved each other for the sake of Allah. It's not for business. So if, if it happened that, and there was a gathering where people were talking and something bad said about me or something bad said about him, oh, we're going to word this off. We're going to defend each other. We're going to stop this. The hypocrite is on the opposite. So the hypocrite, whenever he disputes with somebody who he used to be his partner or close friend or whatever, he's going to discredit this person even by making up lies. That's called al-fujru fil khusuma. So he will make up stories. And yeah, one day I visited him and he was beating his wife badly. And he's very abusive and his kids hate him. And when it comes to, you can even report him to uh, the FBI or report him to, in order to harm him, lying, lying. So this is typically uh, the hypocrites behave like that. Those four evil qualities. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam warned Muslims, now not the hypocrites, that whoever possesses any of these evil traits, which those evil traits when the Prophet Sallallahu warns against them, then they have been categorized as major sins. Because there is a serious warning against them. Whoever possesses them is a munafiq, is a hypocrite. And whoever has any of these evil four traits, then he has one of the traits of hypocrisy until he gives it up. So you are on the verge. You are at a great risk. You want to be called munafiq or a hypocrite? And the uh, either, whenever, either, 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 four times, either to me, either, either, hadatha kadab, either, wa'ad akhraf, either, khasama fajr. Indicates that this person is doing so regularly. You know, sometimes a person would come to you and say, I made a big sin and I feel bad about it and I regret it. What is it? I, I, I lied. Okay, so you know it's a sin, you know it's a major sin. And he feels bad about it and he repents and he doesn't know what to do. Okay, this person is a good person, is genuine. Yes, because we're all as human beings inclined into sinning somehow. So when you sin, you feel bad about it. But the hypocrite enjoys it. He lies like he breathes, like he eats and drinks. It will be actually suspicious if he doesn't lie. So people who know him, they don't, they don't take any statement for him uh, as a truth. They don't take it for granted. They have to verify it. If any person is like that, he's maintaining some of the traits of hypocrisy. By that we understand that lying is categorized as a major sin. And by the way, we have learned about the remaining three evil traits, uh, particularly the last one, fajr, because it's also about lying, entailing lying. Not only, you know, there was a gentleman who divorced his wife, and in the court, uh, the judge was asking him and uh, he doesn't want to disclose the bad traits of his wife. And people were asking him, why are you divorcing her? So he said, listen up, she's my wife and I don't dare anyone to speak about my wife while he is divorcing her. After he divorced her, they came to ask him, so now tell us, what did she do? He said, why am I supposed to speak about somebody whom I don't know? This woman is not my wife anymore, so I'm not supposed to speak about her. 
So the person, the man of honor, under even tough circumstances, when you have, you know, when you have experienced a terrible experience or the person abused you, if I have to complain, I would only say what is true and whenever it is necessary because the Almighty Allah said in Surah An-Nisa, لا يحب الله الجهر بالسوء من القول إلا من ظلم and I would not exceed that. But we hear terrible stuff from a couple who used to sleep together. And the ayah says, هُنَّ لِبَاسٌ لَكُمْ وَأَنْتُمْ لِبَاسٌ لَهُنَّ They strip naked one day or days or months or years. They used to sleep under the same cover. They used to have an intimate relationship. Divorce happens. Okay, it may be the only solution. So after divorce, the person would try to discredit the woman whom he divorced and would say terrible things to ruin her reputation. And she would do the same thing. This is absolutely forbidden and it is a major sin and it is a sign of hypocrisy. وَإِذَا خَاصَمَ فَجَرْ Following hadith is hadith number 1544. In this hadith, which is narrated by Abdullah ibn Abbas radiyallahu anhuma, عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال من تحلم بحلم لم يره كلف أن يعقد بين شعيرتين ولن يفعل ومن استمع إلى حديث قوم وهم له كارهون صب في أذنيه الآنك يوم القيامة ومن صور صورة عذب وكلف أن ينفخ فيها الروح وليس بنافخ The hadith is collected by Imam Bukhari and in this hadith our most beloved Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم said Whoever narrates a dream which he has not will be put to trouble to join into a knot two barley seeds which he will not be able to do so. And whoever seeks to listen to a conversation of people secretly will have molten lead poured into his ears on the day of resurrection. And whoever makes, draws, or carves pictures or images of people or other living creatures, creatures or soul, such as animals or insects, will be severely punished and he will be asked to infuse and breathe spirit or the soul therein which he will not be able to do so. And this hadith, brothers and sisters, is collected by Imam Bukhari. May Allah have mercy on him. <coughs> Excuse me. What do we have here? We have number one, the word hulm. And the same spelling, by the way, has been mentioned, we studied it before, hilm. But what is the difference? Hulm, there is a page, a dhamma on top of the letter ha. If you can just single out on the screen or highlight the word hulm. Hulm with a page. You see, man tahallama bi hulmin. Man tahallama bi hulmin. Al hulm is what you see in your dreams, night vision. While the word hilm, same spelling, and the vowels on the lam and the meme, the same, but the ha. Ah, MashaAllah, the word which is highlighted with red color, man tahallama bi hulmin. If it is a dream, it's called hulm. But if it is uh, with a zir, hilmin, then it is the great quality and characteristic of forbearance. Ah, this guy is very kind, this guy is very forbearing. And the Prophet ﷺ admired one of the companions by the name Ashadu Abd Qais by saying, Indeed, Allah has blessed you with two beautiful traits Al Hilmu Wal Ana, Al Hilm forbearance. And one of the names of Allah is Al Halim, the most forbearing. And normally Al Halim is attached to Al Ghafur, the most forgiving. 
So he said to this companion, Al-Hilmu wal-Ana, forbearance and patience. He takes his time, not rushing. So here the hadith says, if a person pretended or claimed that, oh, I saw in my dream, and he starts narrating a dream, which he didn't see, he's in big trouble. On the day of judgment, Allah the Almighty is not go going to let him slide. Hey, Sheikh, it's just a dream. It's just a joke. Uh, next month will be the month of April and you would hear everyone narrating April fool because they are fool but we as believers there is nothing called April fool and you're not allowed to fool anyone and you are not allowed to lie you're not allowed to fabricate stories even while joking so mere narrating a dream like you wanna make your boss happy and say hey boss yesterday I saw you in my dream I saw you or his mother passed away. I saw your mother, she was standing by the gate of heaven and the angel said, come on in, please enter. You know, uh, you want to bluff him. You want to make him happy by telling him he cannot afford to uh, make him happy financially because he's the one who pays you. So you narrate a dream to him where he said, this guy is a righteous man. This guy is from Awliyaullah Salihin. I believe him. Anyone you tell him that I saw a dream for you, I was leaving the masjid once and somebody stopped me and said, I saw a dream for you. I don't even know the name of that person. And he said, I saw you're going to be Al-Mahdi. I said, okay, thank you. Then I took a hike. You know, there is no point of talking a lot about something that makes no sense. Okay? But if a person says, I have seen a dream while he didn't, and he nears a dream, and he never saw such dream, he will be in big trouble on the day of judgment. This kind of trouble will be, <coughs> you will be given two seeds of barley, two barley seeds. And he will be ordered to make them into braids, like the one who makes his hair. Or join into a nut, two barley seeds. Which is impossible, literally impossible. This is not going to happen. And as long as he's trying, he will be tormented until supposedly he achieves the purpose of tying a knot into two barley seeds and it will never happen. Like uh, uh, when Allah Almighty said about those who disbelieve in Allah, they will never enter paradise, not unless. Until a camel will go through the uh, needle's eye. Which will never happen. Okay, you stay there in hell. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and that's why he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the hadith, يفعل, and he will never be able to tie a knot into two barley seeds. Women istama ila hadith come and look at the Islamic etiquette. A lot of people, uh, one sister was telling me about her husband, and I asked her, sister, this is called so of one, this is suspicion. She said, no, I know he did that for sure. I said, what makes you so certain? He's on call all the time, he's a doctor. She says, because I put a spy device on him. Really? She says, yes. And also I bugged his phone, so I hear all his conversations. And I know whatever text coming in or going out, that's very dangerous. You know, we got to be very careful. We got to be very careful anyway without knowing there is a big brother or big wife. Okay. But is this permissible? Spying is a major sin. <clears throat> You're not allowed to spy on anyone, including your spouse or uh, people whom, like, you know, in the case of countries doing the intelligence, that's something different in order to protect their uh, safety and integrity. I'm talking about individuals <coughs> spying against each other, planting a bug in somebody's clothes or under the desk. In order to hear their conversation, that is not permissible. I'm not talking about the law, I'm talking about before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Two people are sitting and conversing and you lend an ear. You send your ear in order to listen to their conversation. That's a major sin. How major it is. They are whispering because they don't want you to hear. On the day of judgment, 
the angels will pour molten lead in his ears. You don't want this to happen to you, do you? And likewise, whoever uh, imitates the creation of Allah by carving or painting uh, images of living creatures, then he will be tormented while he is commanded to go ahead and make it live. Bring life to it. It's sad, brothers and sisters, when I visit some people, they invite me. And when you walk in, there is a big lion, a statue, or an image of an animal, full animal, <clears throat> a fox or a bird. What is this? They say, this is, oh, we got it from Africa, or a body from here. It was carved in Colombo in Sri Lanka. But this is not permissible. It's not permissible to make. It's not permissible to sell. It's not permissible to keep it in your house. They will say, oh, Sheikh, we're believers. We're not going to worship them. I know we're not going to worship them. But the Prophet Sallallahu said, such statue at home prevents the angels from entering into your house. We gotta take a short break and we'll be back inshallah in a couple of minutes. Please stay tuned. <clears throat> <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. Um, our phone numbers should appear on the bottom of the screen with the area codes. The first couple numbers, local numbers, and the last two numbers are WhatsApp numbers, free calls from all over the world. We have some callers on the line already. Sangeeda from Bangladesh. Assalamu alaikum, Sangeeda. Sangeeda. Hello. Assalamu alaikum, Sister Sangeeda. Welcome Hello. to the program. I hear you. Wa alaikum salam. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum Go ahead, Sister Sangida, please. Can I ask a question? Absolutely. Go ahead. Yes. I have actually... Yes, I'm hearing you. Yes. Can I ask a question? Yes, please. Go ahead. I'm listening. Yes, yes. Um, I have four questions, actually. Mm hmm uh, can I make dua for getting superiority of myself over someone who has oppressed me for some, uh, uh, some, 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 I don't want, I don't, I don't want to make dua for their destruction. Just make, uh, I just want to make for my superiority so that they can of my success and uh, their behavior. Okay. Number one. And number two is, can I make dua to the Almighty that if this thing is not good for me, move the bad thing and make it good for me and give. And number three is, do do, do for my volunteer uh, dua when I make, make volunteer duas like during the uh, dua, making dua uh, between Nikama. And number four is, don't get uh, enough time. Well, Sanjida, uh, the connection is really bad at your end. I got the first two questions, which I will be happy to answer. And you can, and you can uh, leave your second, uh, third and fourth question, if you want, uh, with the control. Assalamu alaikum. Hanif from Bangladesh. Assalamu alaikum, Hanif. Assalamu alaikum, my beloved Sheikh. How are you? Alhamdulillah, Brother Hanif. Thank you for asking. May Allah bless you and your family. Go ahead, Brother. My, my beloved Sheikh, I have been trying to call Sheikh Ishubisters ever since last year, but uh, there seems to be something wrong. Could you please send him the message? And I have a question. Hanif. I, I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, you know. Obviously, the connection is bad again. Let's try a, a call from the USA, Sister Rubina. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to the program, Sister Rubina. Jazakumullah khair. Uh, Mama Salah, 
Amar Musala, I have three questions. Mm -hmm. Number one is, uh, what should we read if somebody uh, keeps getting nazar over and over mm. for the the nazar? I don't know by Quran and uh, Sunnah. What should we pray? Uh, some of the family members are saying you you take the egg and three times you decide and throw. Some people do it with the white cloth. Uh, I'm confused. If you can please a uh, little bit elaborate on this, uh, what should we pray for the Nazar? Okay. And uh, my question number two is uh, some family members say when somebody passed away uh, after four, 40 days, uh, you're supposed to pray like 40 day prayers and uh, you cannot argue with them whether it's right or wrong. And if they invite you to their house to come pray these 40 day prayers, should we go or not? And uh, my question number three is, uh, I'm confused on re reciting after the Salah, the, the Tasbiyah for 33 times, uh, SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, and Allahu Akbar should be 34 times or 33 times. Okay. Um, that's it. That's all my Thank three questions. Sister Rubina, when you say nazar, you mean by that the evil eye, correct? You pray? Okay, got your questions. Sister Shadia from the USA, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum aslam, Sheikh. Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Um, that I, I heard this uh, lady pastor talking uh, in Pakistan that uh, about the, I, I, saw, I saw on a social media actually about this uh, uh, Darud Ibrahim mm. and she said that we as a Muslim uh, send uh, blessing to uh, Prophet Ibrahim and his, his descendant mm. which are like uh, Jews and Christian in every Salah mm. and then we send uh, sal salutation to uh, Prophet Salah so how could we say that we are, you know, they, they are uh, like uh, not believers and uh, <laughs> they are not going to go to heaven while okay. we s send salutation five times a day, every day in every salah. Okay. So I, I got kind of confused about it. Why are you confused, Sister Shadia? Uh, let me ask a question. Prophet Muhammad's uncle, uh, Abu Lahab, wasn't his immediate uncle from his family? Shadia, can you hear me? Uh, not too, too clear, no. I, I, I couldn't hear you properly. Sh Shadia, can you name the uncles of Prophet Muhammad, those whom you know? Prophet Muhammad's uncles. Uh -huh. You know Abdullah ibn Abbas yeah. was his uncle. Uh, Abu Talib was his uncle and his foster father. Abu Lahab was one of his uncles, correct? Uh, Al-Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib wasn't Prophet Muhammad's uncle? Can you hear me now? Right, yeah, I could hear right. you. Right, so when we say Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad, are Abu Lahab and Abu Talib and the rest of people from the family of the Prophet who did not accept Islam, are they included in the family of the Prophet or Alul Bayt whom we pray for them? Of course not. So we say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad, the family of Muhammad, those who believed in Allah, believed in the message of Rasulullah and were righteous, right? So we pray for his wives, his daughters, and uh, his uncles, those who accepted Islam, Al-Abbas and his family, Abdullah ibn Abbas, those are the family of the Prophet, al Bayt al Nabi. Even though Abu Talib was Ali's father, and Abu Ja'far's father, and Abu Muhani's father, all his three sons were Muslims and companions, but Abu Talib refused to accept Islam, despite his support to Islam and Muslims. But he's not included in our prayer, he's not a believer. Abu Lahab is cursed by Allah, is cursed in the Quran, even though he is the Prophet's uncle. So when we say, Wa Ali Muhammad, those who believed and were righteous among them. 
ويساي اللهم صلي على ابراهيم على كما صليت على ابراهيم على ال ابراهيم نمبر 1 ان ذا دعاء وي ار نوت ميكين دعاء فور ابراهيم بيكوز الله هاف بليس ذيم اند وي ار سين او الله send your peace and salutations upon prophet muhammad and the family of prophet muhammad as you did send your peace and salutations upon prophet abraham and his family who are the family of prophet abraham his immediate father is he included nope the quran refutes that when allah the almighty says وَمَا كَانَ اسْتِغْفَارُ إِبْرَاهِيمَ لِأَبِيهِ إِلَّا عَنْ مَوْعِدَةٍ وَعَدَهَا إِيَّا فَلَمَّا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ أَنَّهُ عَدُوٌ لِلَّهِ تَبَرَّأَ مِنْ إِنَّ إِبْرَاهِيمَ لَأَوَّاهٌ حَلِيمٌ So Prophet Ibrahim himself was not permitted to seek forgiveness nor pray for his own father because his father refused to believe in Allah. That's it. Now I can quote tens of verses from the Quran explaining that, that those who disbelieved from among the people of the book will never enter paradise. But this is just a, enough refutation to such claim. And Sister Shadia, not everyone opens a YouTube channel or says something on the social media uh, we listen to him and say, uh, now I got confused. There is no confusion whatsoever. Sister uh, Rubina from the USA, um, she said, what kind of supplication is most useful to protect against another evil eye? Uh, you want a simple prescription or you a long one? The simple one is the Mu'awwizat, which you guys like to call them quls, the three quls. So when you recite, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحْدُ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ The set of the three chapters, that's an enough means of protection against the another or the evil eye. At al kursi is the most powerful means of protection against the evil eye, envy and so on. Obviously, a person who is regularly reciting the morning set of adhkar and the evening one is protected against that. Then also, if you assume that somebody uh, is giving you whatever, don't tell him or tell people, just say, Allahumma barik, ma sha Allahu, la quwwata illa billah. That should be sufficient, Sister Rubina. Every uh, culture have their own cultural traditions which sometimes compete with their religious traditions. So I know in the Indian subcontinent and not only in the Indian subcontinent, in the Arabic countries, in the Arabic countries, they commemorate the death of a beloved person when he or she dies by gathering three weeks after the death, one week after the death, and 40 days after the death, then annual anniversary. All of that is not permissible. All of that, simply mere innovations, and attending such gatherings is not permissible. If I'm invited, and I know that we're going to attend the forties in order to pray for the dead person and give everyone a para of the Quran, distribute 30 paras so that we can make khatmul Quran, that is not permissible. So I will not even receive a reward for reciting Quran, no. Because the whole setup in this condition is an innovation. And our most beloved Prophet Muhammad وسلم, never did it, never prescribed it. And you know how many of his family members died during his life? You want to count with me? He lost all his sons during his life. He lost all his daughters with the exception of Fatima. May Allah be pleased with her during his life. So we're talking about six of his children died. You know, and Ruqayya and Umm Kulthum died after the migration. Did he, and Zainab, did he through commemoration after 40 days? Did Shouldn't he have gathered the companions to pray for his daughters after they died or his family members or the companions, the shuhada of Uhud? No, he didn't. He never did. But he used to go frequently to visit the Baqiyah graveyard and the graveyard of the martyrs in Uhud. If anyone else suggested any other practices or traditions, assuming that uh, it is better or it is good, then he is either accusing Prophet Muhammad or 
lagging behind, not knowing what is good for the welfare of his ummah and his companions, he missed it out. Or, yeah, he knew, but he didn't do it. And this is literally an accusation or betrayal because this is deen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Qais from the USA. Ya Qais, welcome to the program. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Saleh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, brother. Welcome to Huda TV. I have two questions for you, inshallah. No. Um, my first question is regarding the Salah, the prayer time for Salah al Aisha. Mm. Um, I've heard many different uh, people say different timings, uh, like until the timing is complete. Yani. The question is when does Aisha prayer time finish? And uh, where is the proof for this? Because I've heard people give different uh, things, say different things, but I've never seen any proof, so I'm kind of scratching my head. Um, and uh, the other thing, inshallah, is um, with regards to parents. So the question is, if your parents um, are upset uh, at you for something that is not that you did not do wrong, um, is it the is it your responsibility to seek their forgiveness um, to make them happy again, even though again it was you, you did nothing wrong? And if so, why? Why is it mm -hmm. uh, again proof if if you have or just some explanation? And as, Kais, to a, uh, uh, as far as the Aisha prayer time, are you asking about the end of its time? Yes, the end of its time. Okay, got your questions. Um, uh, simply. Okay, uh, Assalamu alaikum. Amatullah from Germany. Assalamu alaikum, Amatullah. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Go ahead. Uh, I wanted to ask if you could make a program in which you name some weak narrations because I recently got to know that some narrations which I always believed in are very weak and they are very like many people believe in them so i wanted to ask you if you could at least name and in the end of every episode maybe one narration which is very weak but still many people believe in it so that like we know that it's actually weak it's a good idea but those weak and fabricated hadith are uh, plenty thousands of them so instead of confusing the viewers, because like if I'm teaching Riyadh al-Salihin, I refer to this hadith as a sound hadith narrated by so and so. And if it is a weak hadith, I confirm to the viewers it's a weak hadith. How many hadith did we study so far? 1,545 hadith, 44 actually. We're about to study the 45th inshallah. So that's a lot of hadith. We're talking about 1,500 and more. Perhaps, I can do that on my page with the phone because otherwise a program, it costs a lot. And obviously if it costs, then I would request you guys to sponsor the program or say, Amatullah, yes, go ahead and sponsor this program and inshallah we'll have somebody do it. Thank you, Amatullah. Rubina from the USA, 33, 33, 33. Tasbih, tahmid, takbir. Then that's total 99. And after you finish the 99, the 100 will be La ilaha illallah Wahdahu la sharika lah Lahu al-mulk wa lahu al-hamd Yuhyi wa yumit wa huwa ala kulli shay'in qadiyah Thank you, Rubina from the USA Assalamu alaikum Sister Maryam from the USA Welcome to Huda TV Sister Maryam, go ahead Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, I'm doing fine. And you? Alhamdulillah, I'm, I'm fine. Thanks. I have two questions, mm -hmm. inshallah, if the time permits. My first question is that I have a um, preschool, which is only for, um, it's an Islamic preschool. Alhamdulillah. And I wanted to know, as you were just previously discussing, about making um, sculptures or making drawings, I want to know if it's permissible to um, have the arts and crafts. What we do sometimes is we have arts and crafts, like throughout the field we'll have, we'll make an elephant out of paper um, so that the kids get the concept that there are surats in the Quran and that they're familiar with surats in the Quran that are 
Ankabut or Nahmo or Nahmo that that they get the familiarity mm. or they get familiar with the surahs. Mm -hmm. And so we'll make like a bee or we'll make a spider out of paper and like black and yellow for the bee mm. um, out of paper plates. So I want to know if that's permissible. Is that considered? Um, like you said, that the hadith of some that we Salam cannot Salam. make um, images mm -hmm. um, or or because it's not sculpture, it's just out of paper. But I wanted to know if that was permissible. That was my first question. Should I wait for the answer or should I go proceed with the second question? Go ahead for the second question. Okay, Tayyip. So, inshallah, I have um, sometimes uh, an injury that prevents me from going to a particular area of my um, room or house to pray. So sometimes I pray in a room where I just make a sutra, like sometimes the laundry basket is my sutra. Mm. So is that permissible if the laundry basket has like, <laughs> I mean, understood, understood. <laughs> the dirty clothes? Yeah. You understand? Okay. Jazakal khayr, Shaykh. Okay. What is permissible uh, for the kids is an exception. So the Prophet وسلم, saw Aisha radiallahu anha playing with girls, dolls, and he didn't mind because it is for kids. Obviously, the kids and the art class are not going to make an identical sculpture or uh, mujassam for uh, the animals or the insects. It is something approximate, okay? without the fine details. So this is an exception for the kids for this purpose. But the art teacher who would make something similar to the reality that is not permissible. According to the understanding of the hadith and the opinion of the vast majority of the scholars. Some of the scholars differentiate between the sculpture and the carving and the painting or the drawing. And they say there is a difference. Okay, so it is worth of mentioning here. Uh, when I was young, I was, by the grace of Allah, talented in painting, even before studying that. So I used to wait for the art class like, you know, that was the best thing in my life. And the art teachers realized that, so I, they started assisting me. And I used to draw images, and I have a beautiful picture which I drew from my father when I was very young. Identical, mashallah. Then when I came to know, when I studied in an Azhar at the age of 12, that uh, growing human beings and living creatures is not permissible, I was kind of disappointed. Uh, but I quit and I started learning a different type of art, the calligraphy, uh, the wood carving, the leather carving, the copper carving, glass carving, uh, marble likewise, uh, poetry. I mean, art is very wide, very huge field, mashallah. So the alternative is there. Nature, it doesn't have to be living creatures trying to make their images. But um, as I said, for the kids, for the person of explanation, this is okay. Not for the purpose of actually making an artwork similarly uh, identical to the any of the living creatures. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. As for the sutra, it is permissible to pray anywhere as long as the place is tahir that you're offering the prayer on. Living room, uh, even in the kitchen, as long as it's tahir. It is best, of course, to have a designated area where you would acquire maximum khushu'ah. But you said that you have some injury which prevents you from moving around. Assalamu alaikum. Sister Samra from Canada. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa Sister Samra, welcome to the program. Go ahead. So, uh, Chris, uh, my question is related to um, another somebody recently called, and maybe it is linked to the same question. Uh, it's about the parents. Mm. That if you are having disagreements with them uh, on a continuous basis, and you are not disrespecting them, but still hurting them, right? Mm. And somehow uh, they don't live up to your expectations and you lose certain respect uh, from your heart or so the love uh, a parent should have mm. and you miss that love in your heart. How big is that a sin? Because you are not disrespecting them in any way. You are being obedient with them and you are doing all that you can, but still because of the disagreements, 
this is happening to your heart so what should a person should do in that situation does that make that person uh, a disbeliever because that because they are not doing what is required um can you please explain uh, how long like how much disagreement we can have with a parent and, uh, okay so first of all sister samra no it doesn't make them disbelievers or criminals or big sinners but i will explain further inshallah uh, last caller for the day assalamu alaikum Muhammad from the Philippines. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Go ahead, brother Muhammad, please. Yes, uh, I'm actually reading a book. I'm actually even reading Riyad Solishin. Mm -hmm. And someone told me about another book that I also read. And I found some story inside. I read some story. Then I wanted to ask about the authenticity of those stories because very hard for me to to believe in that okay muhammad you're then, watching you're watching this program on facebook yeah. correct you said uh, you're watching the program right now on the facebook or the youtube mm. I, I, i'm not really understanding muhammad how are you watching me right now on the screen or social media on on YouTube. Excellent. You go on my page and list all the stories and the questions that you have. You do that right now. I, inshallah, after the program, I will attend to them. Why? Because we actually ran out of time. So it won't be feasible to narrate the stories. Then I will judge them. The, the ahadith or the stories that you're reading and you want to find out about their authenticity, whether today or any time, you can go to my Facebook page, M. Salah Official, and inbox me and say, I'm Muhammad from the Philippines. That's my Facebook page. You say, I'm Muhammad from the Philippines, and inshallah, today I will answer you once I get your stories. Sanjida from Bangladesh. She says, it's per is it permissible to pray against my oppressor that, oh Allah, make me superior to him or them, so I, I will show them that they were wrong? Any dua, because your second question is also related to the first, any supplication, as long as you're not asking for something which is forbidden or may lead to severing the relationship or something bad, it is permissible. So I'm asking myself, I'm asking Allah to make me superior to the rest of people. Okay, may Allah make you superior in righteousness, in piety. Okay, if somebody have oppressed you or hurt you, it will be best to say, Hasbi Allah wa ni'mal wakil. Sufficient for me indeed is Allah, and He's the best disposer of all affairs. Um, also, is it permissible to ask Allah, that's her question, Sanjida from Bangladesh, to ask Allah to do something, to make something which is bad now, to make it better for me, it is permissible. Um, well done with Sister Shadia's questions. Remaining for us, as Qais from the USA and also Samra from Canada irrespective of the second question. Qais is saying that about the controversy of uh, the last time for Aisha prayer. And what is the proof? Jibreel, angel Gabriel, peace be upon him, in the sound hadith came to our messenger, Muhammad, peace be upon him, in two consecutive days where he led him in the five daily prayers. The first day, he came to him at the early time for Fajr, for dawn, once it is dawn. Second day, he came before sunrise, but it wasn't sunrise. Then, for Dhuhr, in the first day, he came once the sun moves away from its meridian. Okay, then, on the second day, he led him in the Dhuhr prayer, uh, when the object or the shadow, the length of a shadow of an object was equivalent to the shadow or to the length of the object itself which is right before the beginning of the time of Asr and similarly with every prayer. He came the first day he led him at the earliest time and in the second day he came and he led him at the latest time. So because of that the vast majority of the scholars are of the view that the time for Isha the second day Jibreel, peace be upon him, led Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in the prayer, was before midnight. So midnight is the last 
uh, time for the Isha prayer. I understand that some view said it is extended till Fajr and some say two thirds of the night. But I just presented to you what happened between Gabriel, peace be upon him, and Muhammad sallallahu Our parents are everything in our lives. That's the second question, an answer to your second question and Samar's question. And uh, no matter how much we try to be dutiful and kind to them, there will be some drops here and there. You know, when my father was uh, seriously sick, and I was as sick as him or even more, based on the lab results. So I was lying down next to him and I was begging him to take the medication and said, I can't, I'm not taking anything anymore. Don't push. The if, you, if, you, if you check out the conversation, you think I'm forcing him to do something. But because out of love, I want him to take the medication. And because he was in severe pain, he was refusing. Is this an argument? No. Will he be blameworthy because you're forcing your dad to take the medication? No. You understand? So an argument which is constructive, no problem. But when Allah says, off. They ask you to do something and it is affordable and it is halal and you think too many requests, off. That's a major sin, that's haram. You feel that they are a burden, that's a sin, that's haram. But you're married and your wife is a very righteous woman, is a very good woman and she's a mother of your kids. So uh, your mom is having an issue with her. She says, I will never be happy with you until you divorce your wife. Uh, am I supposed to listen to my mother or to my father or to my parents because this is being obedient to my parents? No, you shouldn't. And if you do, you will be a zalim. You will be wronging and doing injustice to your wife. So an obedience in what is permissible, not on account of uh, being unjust to somebody else, no matter who is who this person is. I hope you comprehended what I mean and I, ho I have several episodes of Gardens of the Pious talking about Birrul Walidayn and being pious to the parents. We explain that in details. We ran out of time. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Forgiving all about him in paradise Worshipping cows, fire and stones Selling the best with the cheapest price So why did they ignore that? Forgetting all about hell and paradise Worshipping cows, fire and stones Selling their best with the cheapest price